Welcome to this podcast where director Jeff T. Thomas chats with some of the most talented TV and film directors in the industry. This is an in-depth look at how they got into the business as well as sharing some of the most defining moments in their career. This is The Director's Podcast. From short films at age 10 in an old industrial town in England to hugging Robert De Niro in New York City, he said no to a million dollar deal while being broken on welfare. He sold his movie to Harvey Weinstein at the Cannes Film Festival and tells on how he was let down by Bruce Willis. My next guest has directed three movies, produced two, and directed several TV shows on both sides of the Atlantic. When I spoke to Scott Mann, I asked him if he remembered the very first moment that he realized he wanted to work in the film business. So I guess my, my kind of will start, I, I grew up in a town called Newton Aircliffe in, in the northeast of England. Like it was an old munitions town that was built for the war in the 40s. And basically since the war finished, there was nothing there industry-wise. So there wasn't a lot of things going on really. And it was, uh, you know, and I, I would say I had a lovely childhood of like, I had obviously friends, we'd play outside and it was kind of simple, um, not a lot of money, but but never kind of feeling, but never feeling any of that really, you know, and you don't know when you're young, I think. Uh, and I always would put it down, and in retrospect, I think I put it down to like, it, it was kind of poor town, but, but there was no crime or violence really. It was very like passive and, and almost just kind of, kind of calm and quiet. And so I guess as kids, we would use our imaginations a lot and that probably feeds into this too. And my um, my oldest brother, he really was into music and would write a lot of music. And then my middle brother, who I shared a room with, he would write stories. And, and I remember going back as far as probably when we were five, uh, or when I was five, he was six. And I remember we wrote, we both wrote our own first book. And, and, and we had, and mine was The Adventures of Medford. And basically it was an, like an action adventure based on uh, one of my you know, favorite films at the time, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, and it, actually, if you look at the book, I think I just, I, just, I just copied Raiders of the Lost Ark and Medford gets chased by a big rock boulder to steal some treasure at the start. And I think George, my brother, he was always a much better writer than I was. And, and actually he ended up uh, becoming a, a, a kind of famous author in his, in his future years. So he kind of stuck down that path. But we would talk a lot about story and my older brother as well with music and, and storytelling. And I think we, it was kind of a creative vibe because we were probably quite bored in all honesty, like, uh, uh, you know, uh, growing up. Scott then started to animate on his home computer. After mastering two-dimensional animation, he saved up all his money and his parents helped him buy his first video camera. And that changed everything. And it was like it opened up this whole world to me of like, you know. I can imagine. Yeah, because you go from like 30 frames of animation to I can film and I can do all these things and, and everything I've kind of read about like little silly camera tricks like making someone disappear by cutting it. It just felt like an amazing, like I just felt like I had so much opportunity to kind of do things, it was like it definitely, I, I remember the Christmas day, I made a short film on Christmas day with my brother, uh, like a little action and like thriller thing through the house. And, and and I just remember how how much fun it was and how kind of, the, and I, I can like even talk about it, the nostalgic feeling of, of having a warm kind of stomach of, of having this thing. Then I went on to make films with that basically from that point on. As all of Scott's movies have so much action in them, I asked him if action was something that he wanted to do, even at an early age. Yeah, I think so. I think I always like my favorite movies, uh, like uh, I think the 80s and 90s, and well, and, and what went on to be the 90s. Yeah, but the, my favorite 80s movies that I loved around the time, you know, I, I think I would kind of do a version of those, you know? And um, like thinking of the time frame, I was born in 79, and I got a camcorder, I want to say, it was probably 89. And then, yeah, over that period, I like my favorite movie came out during, like uh, during that period, like Terminator 2 came out and I remember that having a big kind of impact. Um, uh, but, but yeah, I, I grew up and loved a bunch of, like I loved Robocop, like the, the Indiana Jones series, like, um, Aliens. And then I grew up a bit and ended up loving Alien more uh, uh, later on in life. But, um, uh, but yeah, I guess these action, like too old for a kind of 10 year old really, right? So, so like these action, um, like more hardcore things that I'd, I'd watched with my big brothers. And yeah, sorry, to go back to films, I think I, I, I ended up doing kind of 
little skits that would be kind of more action and genre based. And I and I do recall kind of it was just a lot of fun, just kind of like adding sound effects of like punches and gunshots, like holding sticks of wood and gun, and then having my friends kind of like blast away and and um and it gave me like honestly I think it gave me a there's an element of like. Uh, like I was never particularly very good at sports or anything. It's nice to be good at something, right? And make something your own. I think when you're a kid, and 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 I felt like this was one thing that that I genuinely loved, and that, that yeah, that I, I kind of everyone seemed to rally into and enjoy with me. And and I just did short. I did a combination of like short films that I made outside of school and things, which is either with like let's say a group of friends on a Friday night, and we'd shoot like in the evenings, and it would usually be like some kind of silly fight. And then, like someone chasing someone, you know, just basic kind of um, uh, uh, kind of shorts. Were you um, directing all... at that point? Did you know what the jobs yeah, were? Yeah, I didn't or... really know. Well, I knew kind of what a director was from kind of studying, uh, you know, like like watching films and studying films, I guess. But I, I, so I would direct and shoot them usually, and then and then at, you know, there's times when I would also like be in them, you know, in one way. But but then obviously I have someone shoot me, and then it would be a case of like my brother. Ben, he would always do the music for them, and I kind of learned to edit and do crash editing and those kind of things. So I think, you know, I think you know between I guess probably 11 years old, certainly for those first like four or five years of just making stuff. And I think that's the key to like anything. Like looking back, I think it's like if you just make stuff, even if it's shit, you just kind of like bash through it and smash through it and make. You discover kind of what works from like a film language view, and and I think very often. Like you do, kind of look into like why does my film look shit compared to a real film, and it makes you focus on what what does make, it. And, and that forces you down an avenue of like, oh, it's because the lights, and then you discover like, oh, I need better lights, and and I remember at school for my for my like project at technology class, I built a light, a film light, which then I used like on every film I did. It was just like one halogen 500 uh, watt halogen lamp on an adjustable um, uh, beam thing, right? But but I remember my films were completely different after I kind of had that light and I would put it in the house. I'm sure my parents, like when I'm shooting in my bedroom, were like, Christ, God, oh, like, what, what, what is it? It's like a nuclear bomb's gone off. <laughs> but, um, uh, but, but you know, you discover out light and then you discover out edit and then you discover how powerful sound effects are and you discover how, you know, like um, all the different, all the different things that feed into filmmaking, I think, like that was my early education of that, I would say. It was now time for Scott to get serious about his craft. And I remember that I thought, I'm going to consciously try and make the very best film I possibly can as a kind of showpiece, right? Like as something. And I remember like, I remember thinking about it, what can I do? What's the best way to do this? And, and someone said to me, you know, you should just try and like harness the stuff you're good at, like harness the stuff you know and you're good at. And I decided to make it like a mix of animation and live action. So I could use like my computer and do animation and combine that live action, do like a little short action film um, that I could be proud of and I could do. Um, and so I I set about making this film called The Sneeze, which is which again, just to kind of steal other people's work, was a homage to Terminator 2, my favorite film that I kind of know backwards by now. Yeah. And, um, uh, and, and basically had me playing, uh, well, me, I guess, uh, watching Terminator 2 as a, as a clear nod right from the top, right? I, I'm, I'm in my bedroom watching the end of Terminator 2, and then I have a runny nose, and I kind of like, uh, I basically do the giant sneeze, and it's this giant kind of green thing splats on the wall, And then it forms like the like mimetic polyalloy in Terminator 2. It forms into the little version of me. And then it tries to kill me throughout the house. So it was like, it was, um, yeah, it was a combination of like little bits of action tension, animation. And uh, why have I uh, not seen this? This sounds amazing. Yeah. Oh, you don't, yeah. I'll, I'll, well, I'll, I'll, I'll send you it after this. It's, uh, but it's, but it was, yeah, it's, it, but it was a lot of, you know, that was the first film I focused on that I thought I'm going to go start the finish and try and make a really good job and use the best version of everything I've got and make it, you know, just focus on quality. Uh, was it a long film? Get... Was it like five minutes, ten minutes long? It was about five, yeah, five or six, yeah. I imagine. And it was, um, and the, but even then, like the animation, like my mum uh, helped me film it. Um, my brother Ben did the music, um, and uh, and then I done, I played the little character. So what I did is, I kind of filmed myself doing all the action of this character in the garden, and then I kind of frame by frame traced and rotoscoped round that image and then shaded it in by hand and made these animations. So it was kind of like 
So I had a nice kind of animation motion of the, of the little character. That short film went on to win a whole array of film competitions. His favourite magazine at the time, Camcorder, did a feature on him. And he also got a place at his local film school. Um, uh, a place called Cleveland College of Art and Design. And their claim to fame was Ridley and Tony went there. And, um, and, and the best thing was like it's when they would show you... It's, it, is, it is, I know. It's just like, it couldn't be better, I suppose. But, um, uh, and they would show short films that, that, that those guys did. Boy and, a bicycle, and, like, and stuff. Yeah, Boy yeah. And a Bicycle. Yeah, and a couple of others as well, I think, that were kind of a bit crappier, but in the college. While studying at film school, Scott's short film The Sneeze continued to break new ground, this time at a competition at Granada Studios. And then I won the, uh, like, two categories, I think I won. Mm. Um, and I got an award from Ken Barlow, which was, like, the oh. moment of my life. Wow. I was like, oh, God, it's yeah. Ken Barlow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I should have read that out in the introduction. <laughs> I tell you what, yeah, Robert De Niro and Ken Barlow are, are the, uh, yeah, uh, 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 yeah, the incredible actor. And to be fair, though, actually, Bill Roach is an incredible actor. All those people do not get the uh, sure. the credit they deserve yeah. on that show. But, um, but he was lovely, and he gave me this award, and... Um, uh, and then while I was there, I was going around a workshop. Something weird happened where I was going around these workshops where they were teaching things. And the animation person was actually showing my film as an example of animation combined with video and was kind of talking about my film, and uh, which was kind of cool. I was like, oh, this is my film. And then he invited me over. Uh, and then while I was there, I met someone from Granada Studios who was setting up a couple of cable channels. One was Men and Motors and the other one was the called Granada Breeze. And he basically said, he was like, you should come in for an interview with my boss because I think he'd love you and he'd want you to work for us and actually get a job at Granada Television. But so I went back a few, I don't know, months later or something and had this interview and they basically said, look, we can start tomorrow, but do you want to finish your course first because you've got another like year left in your course and maybe you should do that. Um, and so, so I opted that to finish the film course and then I had that job kind of uh, literally like the the Friday I finished my film course that I moved to Manchester that weekend I started working at Granada on wow. Monday, so, um, so you were 17 when you started working in Granada you were working at yeah how long did you stay there for I well ultimately I was there for three years um and and as a training ground is amazing like uh, I um mm. uh like I started off really uncomfortably because you get thrown into a job that you don't like officially I was an assistant researcher right it was my actual contractual position and and to be honest like on six grand a year, I felt rich because I was like, oh my yeah. God, I got like, oh, I got thousands. You actually got money. <laughs> yeah, holy shit. Um, uh, and so I um, I was there three years, but I, I kind of progressed. I became, I went from being like assistant researcher to researcher to assistant producer, producer, then producer director, then series director. So I kind of went up this kind of pegged thing. Um, I remember like the first week I was there, I was being forced to kind of set up guests. Like, like the comfortable part of my job was I was going out into the Manchester Town Centre, like filming people and doing like a VT essentially, like uh, like interviewing a couple of people and doing like daft stuff on camera. And it was like, that was fun. And I was like, oh my God, I'm doing this professionally. And I felt very pressured and I was very stressed, but it was very exciting. So I got to use like real cameras, real edit suites, Avid, all that stuff. Three years went by. And as much as Scott enjoyed working at the studio, he knew that he was going to have to make a move towards doing scripted content again. If he was to stay on track to fulfill his dream. I, I noticed the separation vastly by go, like looking at Granada Film, what they were doing. And and I, I remember I went to see Granada Film and, and Pippa at Cross, I think it was, at Granada Film, and, and talked to her about getting into the film side. And she kind of like laid it out to me. She was like, do you know, to do film, what, what, what might typically happen is that maybe if you come across as a runner, and I did a bit of running on one of the dramas just to see what that was like, right? Um, but she was like, maybe you'll come as a runner, then you might become a third. And then maybe you might skip sec second eventually and get to a first after about nine years. And then then sometimes like you might get a directing opportunity on the back of being a first if you're a really good one. Um, or maybe some second year directing. And, and, it, and she laid out this decade long plan, I think it was. And, and I remember thinking, holy fuck. And especially as a kid, as a mm. like 21, 22 year old. Decade kid, just like, seems like an eternity at that point. Yeah, I was convinced I was going to be dead by 25, right? So I was like, there's no fucking way I'm sticking around for that plan. <laughs> so, um, uh, so no, so I tried to, I, I really wanted to quench that burning thirst of like making a film and making a short. And I tried to do, so I tried to do that again, now having kind of more tools at my disposal and professional people around me. Um, I got together with uh, uh, like producer friends uh, at Granada and some of my filmmaking buddies from film school. And it was like, let's 
make a really big, great short film in the same principle of like the sneeze, right? Let's make one that is going to stand out, do really well, like a gem that we can like hustle together and create. My friend from film school had written, Nick, had written this great short film that he planned to do because he went on, when I left, he went on and did the higher national diploma version, right? Of yeah. The same course. Um, and he'd written this short film, which is like a 25 minute short film comedy. It was really good. And I remember thinking, we should make this like a proper, and I remember he was having trouble like making it properly and it really was depressing him. Um, and, and that became kind of this short film that it was supposed to end all short films. And, um, and I managed to, you know, between me and my friends, we all managed to pull in these huge favors and we got film cameras from Granada Film. From okay. Cold Feet was Cold Feet was shooting season and we got their like B cameras because they were out for a week. It was 16 like mil that. or 35? 16. Or? 16 right. it was, yeah. yeah. Um, super 16. Um, and uh, and managed to kind of, you know, I, I kind of knew a couple of Coronation Street people at that point. So I kind of asked, you know, like, like reached out to them to see if we could get them involved to get a couple of names and then tried to get kind of funding and it was like, um, and it was it was a big experience to kind of do that. And it ended up being like 15, 20 grand they cost this whole thing. So wow. it was a big production considering it was like financed independently. Um, and in the end it was a disaster really. Like the, the finance, the, the financer, the big, you know, obviously we were all very wet behind the ears and, and we had all these actors, we had all this noise, we had publicity because that was something kind of, I guess I'd learned through Granada about like, you know, papers and stuff, you know, like doing doing that kind of noise about it. And we had this guy, I can't remember his second name, Michael something, this financer from Manchester who I should have, you know, he had some dodgy office like above a chippy or something, right? And he was like, private finance, do you want me to finance your movie if you want, is it? Yeah. And and we had this big launch party where we were launching it to try and raise money. And he was like, look, I'm going to put all the money in, but I want like, I, I, you know, I want to kind of announce it at the party and be in the papers and all this kind of stuff. And it all seemed fair enough. And we were about two weeks out from shooting and he did that and he went on and he was in all the papers and Mike's new film and all this stuff and it was all fine uh, until it turned out that he didn't put any money in and he just was stealing the publicity and being that kind of guy. And um, uh, and so, yeah, so then we went and thank God, like uh, mainly one of the producers, Gail McLaughlin, um, ended up putting, like essentially putting in the money itself and doing all this stuff and, 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 and there was a lot of... Uh, it you know it was, it was a horrible experience really because we had not enough money it was like all about to fall apart we we're going to lose everything and and it and for me it was the first time working with actors um, at a high level and and I was young as well so I didn't not only did not I not have the inbuilt respect of like a bit of age and you know I was in the the boss position as a kid and, and yeah and it was terrifying to do and 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 in the end. Like, it, oh, this would all be a great story if it turned out to be this colossal film that kind of changed the world, but it turned out pretty shit. So, like, uh, <laughs> in fact, so shit that, like, five uh, five days before production, this is the big disaster, and, and, and uh, we discovered that the script was very similar to an episode of Seinfeld that was out, and not just any episode. And I, I didn't know what Seinfeld was at the time because it hadn't really broken here. It was, like, late night BBC Two yeah, or something. Right, but it yeah. turned out... But it turned out to be the, the biggest episode of Seinfeld ever written called The Contest. Uh, basically, some one of the... This, this college student gets caught masturbating and then they all have to kind of go without masturbating for 10 days, right? Which is entirely the concept of The Contest with Seinfeld, where it's, the, you know, replaced masturbating with sex. Um, so it was kind of raunchy comedy, like raunchy Britcom, right? That yeah. was the... Um, is this Tug of War? It's called Tug of War yeah. now, yeah. Okay. It was called The Only Game in Town. Um, uh, but uh, and Tug of War is such a crass title given the content what were, what were we thinking <laughs> but we actually changed the name because we discovered it was too much like Seinfeld and we wanted to kind of rebrand it and we did all this legal research to kind of get away from the fact that it was similar like none of us knew enough about like legal issues and stuff and clearing and all that kind of stuff like in hindsight if you, that happened now, I would approach it very differently. Do you know what I mean? You would look at it differently. And, and to be honest, if that happened nowadays, you'd probably rewrite it properly and not try and hang on to things you love just because you love them. But it was a very, but it was a, you know, it was a hard situation. And then, and then truthfully, like, I felt like, okay, I didn't, it didn't work. Like directing comedy and directing actors, I just, it didn't work. Like I wasn't very good at it. And I think it was like, I wasn't experienced at all with working with actors. I wasn't confident working with actors. I wasn't like, um, I was out of my depth ultimately, I think in hindsight, right? And it visually looked nice, but it wasn't 
sat, like I look back at that and I'm like, Jesus, look at the mistakes I made as a you know as director, kind of telling the story with characters. I didn't realize it at the time, but um, but yeah, I made all these mistakes and and it really kind of put me in this strange, depressing place where I would say that, and then it doubled down on being depressing that we couldn't then sell it anywhere. Like no one would really take it, right? We went to Channel Four and all these, and we had all these audacious plans for it. But also, like no one wanted it, right? Got kind of kind rejections, but rejections, and it was heartbreaking. And um, uh, and I remember, like, we had to self-fund our own premiere and all this stuff. And it was just, and it was nice that everyone got to see it in this nice environment. And everyone who contributed, I think, you know, it was nice for everyone involved. But it basically cost a fortune. It, it got me in debt. Like, like bloody, my friend had spent the money. It was like all this horrible stuff happened, and and I got really kind of depressed uh, on the back of that. And I was just like, I don't know how to get out of this stupor because I either take ten years to be an assistant bloody director and all this other stuff, path to you know, or you know, I have to do better ultimately. And and um, and yeah, and I just remember having nightmares about it all the time. My night was accentuated by the fact I did this premiere of it um, and uh, it was like proper screening for some reason. Well, I know the reason it's because of my ego and arrogance, right? Is that I was, everyone was saying, you should just like, we, we managed to get a theater at Granada Television. They had this theater in the old theme park and we managed to kind of rent that out to show the film. Um, and everyone was like, why don't you just do it on the on Digi or B, uh, Digi Beta and put it that way, and I was like, no, no, no we're going to do it on real film. We shot it on film. We spiced it on film. Do it, you know. And it was mm-hmm. my real want to do a film, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, and we managed to find this. And, and I don't know if you know, but Super Sixteen projectors are very hard to come by, in England, yeah. right? And there was like three of them or some shit. And we got this guy, this really old guy from some museum, kind of to bring it into Manchester, install it, and do all this stuff, all leading up to this night where it's getting presented. And I remember it was like he didn't have it up and running and people are coming in and all the like red carpet stuff's going on and we couldn't even get a picture. It was really awful. And it caused me all kinds of anxiety. And then, you know, we finally get it and I go and um, present, like say, this like nervously say to a crowd of 400 people watching this thing, including my parents and, and uh, my now wife, Sarah, who had met during this whole process. And it starts playing and, and literally like the first... I remember the first kind of sounds of that film are like, there's like a knock at the door, knock, knock, knock. And the character going, like, Miss Jacobs, Miss Jacobs, Miss Jacobs. And the character goes in trying to find his teacher and then ends up masturbating over some kind of biology book. But but basically, he kind of like, he knocks and it kind of goes. <laughs> and it, you couldn't understand a word. I've been so fixated on the picture that the sound was horrific. And I, and, and, and I was just like, fuck. Oh. So I ran up to the projection booth and I was like, I think to the to the nice old guy, I was like, what sound? He's like, I don't know what sound. I, I don't I, I don't know what happened to the sound. And I'm like, Jesus. And I was like, well, and and the only way we got the projector working was there was he was winding the tear candle by hand because there was a problem with the, you know, oh the thing God. that takes the film back. Yeah. So I said, I'll do that. I'll do that. You see if you fix the sound. So I sat on the floor and I start doing this thing. But hold on, it's still going at this point? Oh, your yeah, film is playing. Oh, yeah, still I'm just playing? trying to quickly resolve this problem mm. because every, cause there's 400 people watching a big screen downstairs and it's yeah. like, Christ. And so I'm winding this thing to do the intake and it's fiddling with it and it's, it, and it's not making it better, it's making it worse. And then the handle broke off, right? <laughs> and the film spat into my lap and it was just spooling in my, in my, uh, in my lap. It's like a metaphor as this thing is playing outside and everyone's like, I just don't know what's going on, it's just a big noise. <laughs> and then, um, and it was like, it was just this real kind of mental scar of, of, of this nightmare situation. Oh um, and uh, no one was laughing at the film at that point either, because it was, and it was supposed to be funny, but no one's fucking laughing because we can't even understand it. And I'm not even sure if it is funny in hindsight, but, um, uh, and then lo and behold, one of my friends from Granada, a guy called Tony Williams, who used to work in that theater and now is, was the head of sound over there. He came up and said, what's going on with the game? Like, the game's way too high. And and I'm like, please help me, Tony, please help me. And the guy, the projector guy, is like, please help us, I don't know what I'm doing. And he, he went over and he fixed the sound. And then the guy kind of managed to get the, the thing in the spool or something and, and, and took it off me. And then I waited for a bit, but there was always a laugh. Like, there was always this moment of laughter. And some, you know, I, when I'd play it for my friend. And I waited for the laugh to happen. And it kind of happened, and I looked down and got into my seat, and it was like, but, 
but by and large, it was like it was it was bad feeling and stress. Like I really pushed myself to a point where I just caused myself this stress, and I think I, I just had this PTSD of that night. With so many things going wrong with just one project, I was curious what that did to Scott's confidence. I just, and I just kept thinking, like, am I shit? Am I just shit? Is that what it is? And am I just kidding myself? And that, and I guess that is a confidence rock, right? Is that you kind of like, I don't think I'm good enough. I actually. Don't so think what I'm did confident. you do? Did you go back to Granada to carry on doing what you were doing? Like I did at first bury myself in the Granada stuff a little bit more. And I tried to kind of go down that path of TV. And, and I started getting offered jobs that were kind of in terrestrial TV, as we called it, like better jobs. Yeah. Um, and I remember thinking, if I go down that route, I'm definitely going to end up down that route because the money is quite good, especially the age. It was like, it was way better money than I was used to. And, and I felt like I'm never going to get to where I actually want to be if, if that's my path. You know what I mean? Like it was like a juncture. So I actually thought I need to, I need to focus properly on, on this, right, on, on filmmaking properly and, and kind of like huddle into what I, like learn what I don't know, like learn how to write properly and, and do, you know, and do basically and, um, and understand that like making a feature is probably better than making a short because then at least there's like a mechanism of, of, of uh, business about it that can operate in the real world and stuff, you know, and, and just, uh, and, but, but try and do something that I can do as opposed to kind of overshoot on something I can't. So like stick right. with what I'm more comfortable with. Scott then decided to leave Granada and take the redundancy and sign on the dole, or welfare, as it's known in America. Then, and then I just tried to kind of bury myself in film and tried to really make an effort to get on that track. And really, I think someone might have said to me, like, look, you really need to, like, go for it and actually go fully for it, not kind of half for it, you know? As something like that. It was some kind of, I'm sure the pearls of wisdom were better than that. But essentially, they were like, if you're serious about this, seriously go for it mm. or don't. Do you know what I mean? Don't kind of flirt with this thing while you're doing this thing. It's very brave, um, yeah. Or stupid, Jeff, you yeah. could say, because I, I, you know, given I was in debt, it wasn't a good time to go on the door. But, <laughs> uh, uh, but, um, but yeah, so I did that and I, and I, and I basically um, worked on this project. I ended up working on this project that I, I basically applied for funding from the film council who had liked some of my short films and it actually it got a bit of attention because of, funnily enough, because of that short film, like I had a little bit of attention there of getting a grant to develop a feature film. And, um, and I went about trying to get my first feature together, which ended up being this drama about a disabled football supporter, a uh, great true story, right, of this guy called uh, uh, Paul Hudson, um, and his nickname's Flipper, and he'd written an autobiography, he'd self-published his autobiography, and it told this harrowing story of him growing up with meningitis and being wheelchair-bound and finding home and normality in his football club. And um, and it was this really lovely story, and and it was a very kind of, I, I guess if you like, a film council-worthy story. Um, so, so to your point, actually, I wasn't necessarily going back to the roots of the thing I truly loved, but I was, it was like a serious, it wasn't comedy. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't kind of daft. It was serious. It was like grounded. And and I felt like it was a story that um, that I, I felt I could tell. And I and I literally spent the next three years of my life, I would say, pretty much focusing, trying to get that off the ground. And it went through a lot of different, that was going to be my first feature. And I went through all this stuff where I learned a lot from that experience. Do you know what but I mean? were I you writing it or were you... I was writing it with another writer, uh, with Nick, and, and I raised little bits of money to shoot like little promo stuff to kind of help get it funded. Um, uh, and, and, and ultimately I learned like, I, I did learn how a little bit to produce on that in terms of like getting a line producer on, like I guess taking what I knew from Granada and expanding it out a bit, right? Um, and uh, got a line producer, then managed to get a casting director in America. Like at one point, the best it got to was it, it apparently got in the hands of Johnny Depp at one point, right? So it kind of, it got reasonably far, but it never, never went. And and, and I remember, I remember um, the big change, the sea change really was I went to Cannes. And by the way, this just sounds like a long story of failure, right? Which is kind of true for a few years. But, but um, I went to Cannes with my filmmaking friends, Jono and Nick, and we were there trying to get 
uh, this film called Down Amongst the Dead Men. We were trying to get it made, right? And we knew we had a decent script, right? Like at that point, it had been through a lot of development and people seemed to like it. Um, but we'd go to the Cannes film market where all these films were getting made and no one wanted to speak to us. It was like, it's like, okay, you've got a parochial, kind of very localized Darlington, who are Darlington? Well, well you don't know them because they're the shittest team in the world. All right, okay, what about, who's the guy? Is he famous? No, he's not famous. He's like a local guy who kind of, blah, blah. and all these things, all these reasons why the commercial film world basically told us to do one and was just like, fuck off lads. Like we're making like, you know, this, this instead. and and. And we basically got rejected and we were kind of on the outside bubble and we were like these 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 three lads kind of wandering around can like like broken you know broken men um and uh and and it yeah and it was the third year of doing this thing and and i think it was our first year of being in can and i remember we were um we were really depressed. We actually got robbed as well, which was another whole thing. So just to make our trip worse, we got robbed by Russians. Did you, did you have like, any money to uh, steal at that point? Well, no, no but my friend <laughs> Jono had a cam... credit cards. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, if only, man. It was like, no, like Jono had his cam card in it, I think. But but, um, but yeah, we, we like someone had the passport taken. It was all... But I remember like our clothes got taken. So like we had like, we had two shirts for like 10 days in Cannes where you're not actually allowed in the Cannes market. So we were like on the outside of the market. And I remember we sat on the beach. I might have my dates mixed up here, but I remember we sat on the beach whilst the, the premiere of like Matrix or something was going on. And it like over there was this incredible party that we weren't allowed me because you know, we couldn't even get in into the UK pavilion, let alone the fucking premiere. So it was like, you were kind of close and tasted it, but couldn't get near it. Um, and and we just got rejected for this film. And, and I remember we were there after this miserable can trip and looking at what got made and looking at what was being sold and looking at what the industry kind of really wanted from a commercial point of view. And we're like, why are we doing this? Like, like we're busting our guts on this film. And as much as it's a nice film and we kind of fell in to tell the story and it's a really good story and everything, like don't get me wrong, it's worth trying. But like really, the films we love are the ones that are getting made. Like the films that we grew up with, that we all loved, all this genre material, we're like, we've just got to think of the stupidest idea we can possibly come up with and then do that. And we, we were like drunk, throwing around really stupid ideas. And the best of those stupid ideas ended up being an assassins tournament where all the world's best assassins gather and there's one winner. And, um, and that became the tournament ultimately. But that, that all came from a miserable can where we realized we're never going to get this film made like this and um, we should focus on what, you know. Yeah, but if you film. hadn't have developed that movie, if you hadn't have gone to Cannes, if you hadn't yeah. seen what was being sold, then you were, it's all about oh. just pushing forward, right? And, you know, yeah. taking your failures on your chin and just, you know, learning yeah. from them. Well, that's the thing, right? If you learn from it, I think it's a complete, it, that's the difference, isn't it? Like, and I think I, I might have, the wrong person here, but I think Mel Gibson said something like, every failure is an education, and it's true. Like, if you if you learn what, yeah, what doesn't work, you then know it does. And I think, uh, like, even, even to the point, to be honest, like, I'd set up a, a company to do that film, like, with friends, and it wasn't quite working, like, the mechanics of that, you know what I mean? And I, I realised that how film rights work and how you have to kind of have control of the rights to be able to actually set it up. And all these things were happening that I'd learned from the first one done wrong. So at that point, basically, Jono and Nick did a, did a treatment of the tournament, like a 10 page treatment, uh, which, was, which was really exciting. It was silly, but it was brilliant. And, um, uh, and I remember it was like, I, I knew that like, I had to kind of lead the way in, it, in a way. And so I set up my own company called Man Made Films. And I optioned it off my friends, which is a very strange thing to do with close friends, because it feels like you're doing something a bit cold. But 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 they kind of knew from the last one, it, it you know, because we'd been through the last one, we knew what happened. It was all actually from a, a decent place of understanding, and I was and we you know so we kind of we all understood the place that we, the part that we had to play. Um, and I I basically I set that up what I felt was the right way, which is basically I spent a year from once I'd read the treatment. I basically said, look, I'm, I'd like to option this and have control of it. You guys get paid and you'll have this, like these rights and everything. I'm not like taking away forever. I just want the rights to put it together. And, and in exchange for that, you guys write the script and I'm going to make a five minute short film that sells it as a, you know, as a trailer that I can come to Cannes with next year and show people, visually show people, this is the film. And, um, 
and that was and, and that's kind of the, the adventure that and, and I would say as a second as the second best time of changing my life for um, moments of shift uh, uh, turning up at Cannes the next year uh, but you made that short film right so you, you did the, do it yep. they did complete the script you made the short film they complete the script I made the short film I got all my kind of Coronation Street friends and actors and all the people that were involved in the other ones and friends and pulled in all kinds of favours um, and shot this, well, what turned out to be like a two and a half minute, three minute uh, trailer promo for the tournament. Mm -hmm. and, um, and how did you how did you pay for it? Are I literally interested? put it on a credit card. I read and I read the book. I tell you what I did. I read there was a first film book. Who was it? it was the Coen Brothers? Was it that did Blood? Uh, thingy, simple. Um, Blood Simple. Yeah. And they were saying how they like how and it was they, like it was it was from the reading what they did to get their film going that, that mm -hmm. this was the planning i just totally took their kind of model and but but i basically yeah so i put just it reminded me of the sneeze honestly like i was like right i'm gonna put every ounce of me in this thing and try and make a great little kind of uh short that that, that sells what this film is about because it's a very concept driven film um and i did that and um and i was very proud of how it ended up and and yeah, but I remember I edited it, man, like the night before Cannes, like I, like I was about to fly out to Cannes. I remember we were still editing the night before we went out. It was really like hairy and uh, to get it even finished. And and I went out with Cannes to Cannes and again, didn't have any real accreditation or anything. But I remember I sat down with this financer from Manchester who, who one of the producers of this trailer, like he knew him and he kind of sat down with him first. And I remember he essentially offered me like a million quid um, uh, to walk away from the whole thing and like not direct it. And I was like, the one condition of this whole thing is I'm fucking directing this. Cause like, I knew how hard it was. It's good job he had a contract to first John no. Wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, good thing I control the rights, right? But, but yeah, that, that was the reason to do it. Cause it, I, I'd felt the threat of that on the other film, right? I'd felt the threat of like, first, every, no one wants you to be, no one wants to hire a first time director, right? Cause it's, you're risking millions in, in un, proven water and and i think that's always the case and, and you have to make it you really have to make it kind of like that there is no other choice because it's mm -hmm. a bad choice for everyone but you ultimately mm -hmm. right like it's not benefiting anyone else but yourself to be given that opportunity so um so yeah so i i turned that down but i had the best like me and my friends that that can was so amazing we were suddenly like the talk of can and it, and it spread because at the time no one was doing these trips like this was a, like a new thing really. like no one really we had a dvd player i got it from argos like and it opened out this little shitty dvd player pair headphones and we'd sit down and we'd watch it i remember showing mark Kaboda and he was like, wow that's amazing and uh, and all these people in the festival and all these buyers distributors and like big and you know quite big cheeses and they were just all you know, it just took, it just got us into part, you know, all this, and the people, oh, he's the best of the tournament. And we're like, yeah, dude. That's yeah. great. That's yeah, it was, it was amazing. And, and, and that, that was the start of kind of getting it together. And we, we ended up meeting uh, Keith Bell, this producer who'd just done Dog Soldiers, um, yeah. and Neil Marshall, who, who directed that. Yeah. Um, and they introduced us to this legendary guy, Vic Bateman, who, um, was a sales agent from the UK, but would specialise in genre and material. So he did, he'd done Dog Soldiers for Neil and uh, Keith. And, um, and Vic Bateman said, oh, Vic Bateman. Oh, and, he, and Vic Bateman's been at the can more times than anyone can can. He's been like 35 <laughs> fucking times. Oh, I sold a good shit. And he was that kind of geezer. And um, and he watched it and he and he loved it. And he was like, oh, of course I fucking want to tell It's great. We'll get his film made, boys. <laughs> so is it based off, so they would offer money and a deal based off the trailer and the, and the pitch of the story or would they actually read the script They as well? well they, were, they were all on the caveat of, uh, we've got to read the script, obviously, but we want to do the movie. Like, that's what, kind of was the thing. Uh, and then, to be fair, the script wasn't quite ready. Like, it wasn't where it needed to be quite, but it was It was kind of, it was in a place where it was kind of ready enough, you know, to, to show people. Um, but yeah, no, they, they, they really saw the trailer. And because the market, because that market, there's loads of like distributors and people around, you really get a gear. If, like, let's just say the guy, like Robert Wallach from Momentum is kind of going, oh, I totally buy that. Like, then the sales guys know, you know, they get that kind of flavor of like the heat of it. And ultimately it was like, I, I probably blown it out of proportion. This is obviously from my perspective at the time, because at the time it felt massive to just get past the of door. It's massive, um, yeah. As a 26 year old? 
Yeah, well, then I'd have been younger, I think. I was, because uh, uh, this is 2000. Oh no, I probably was 25. I suppose I was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 2004. It's amazing. But but um, but yeah, and that was and it and that really kind of got me. I really felt <clears> like <throat> we were in the outside of the bubble of the film industry, and mm-hmm. then that allowed us inside the bubble. And it was like, and you know, once you're inside the bubble, you don't even appreciate how hard it was to be on the outside. Of the yeah, bubble, you forget so quickly. Yeah, you do. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, uh, but but yeah, that's what got it going. Like Vic, Vic um, was like at the time I, I had to learn all this through this experience. But essentially, yeah, that was the start of that adventure. While the script was being written, Scott used the heat he got from the Cannes Film Festival to leverage himself a gig on the British soap opera Hollyoaks, which is just as well as it took two years until the tournament was finally ready to go. I remember this moment where we had actors, we had dates, and the financer was kind of there, about to go, but he really wasn't going until he cast this other role, and everyone was kind of um and an hour and um and an hour. And, and, and I was really broke, and I didn't have any money, and I kept kind of being promised the film was happening, it didn't happen, and I was just like really in a, in a kind of depressed place. And I remember saying, either after or just before, to the, the financer, look, I'm out. If you don't go with this now, I'm, I'm leaving because I can't, and I mean it, I'm gone. Like, we're not doing this film now because I'm, I can't take this anymore. Um, it's, you know, I've got no money, it's not, blah, blah, blah. And, and then he phoned back the next day and said, okay, we're on, we'll go ahead, let's do it. And basically went in production. And it took me to say, and it took me to literally get to the point of, I can't do this anymore. And it's the power of no, right? It's the power of like, as long as you say, I'll wait for you, I'll wait for you, I'll wait for you, I'll wait for you, people will be like, okay, sure, you wait for me. And, and uh, there's a, yeah, it really, but it emotionally took me to that point, right? And it was, so it was like, holy shit. And I remember turning to Sarah saying, oh my God, we're going to production. And she's like, no way. And it was. And as the movie goes into production, Scott and his producer are faced with even more challenges. So when the actual tournament happened, it, yeah, it was, it was not without uh, incident, let's just say. And, um, and so, you know, we finally get to Bulgaria. And the way it's structured is the guy. Weirdly, the guy who offered a million dollars for me to fuck off in Cannes originally ends up being part financer of the movie, right? So he's, uh, I don't know, in fact, full financer in the end. He's, he's going to put in all the money and he started cash flowing, uh, uh, building sets in Bulgaria and things. It's a very strange environment for me to go to a foreign country and stay in a hotel, me and the producer in these like fancy suites over in Sofia. And we start building like the strip bar, the church, all this kind of stuff, and it's like serious stuff, like working on a real production. And um, and we and cash flow's going fine, and then like three weeks in, the cash flow starts drying up, and it's not kind of going through the way it should go through. And there's all sorts of other reasons, but one of the principles was that, 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 that Paul had decided that it was a great time, not only to invest in his first like major feature film, but for him to set up and direct his own feature film, because he'd kind of fallen he had this script called Leona's Revenge and the and the Spanish actress he'd cast in that I have a feeling he might have fallen in love with and um, <laughs> and he decided to buy all the equipment to film it himself like not only shoot it do the sound oh direct it and produce it right with oh a no. with a minimal crew and film it himself and and he was in Spain doing this thing like uh, and and he was doing this while we were prepping the tournament and why he decided to do it then was strange but he anyway went ahead and did it and basically we couldn't get hold of him and in the end the construction crew were getting pissed off rightly so because they hadn't been paid and they just built the thing and it was very much like you know it was like people needed to be paid it wasn't like in Bulgaria you, at the time especially you couldn't be like they, they all needed it to survive it wasn't like you can just oh, hold off a week it's fine it's not okay yeah and so, i'll eat my legs for breakfast yeah basically it was like it was a nightmare <laughs> again and so they were basically rightly pissed off and and they basically managed to finally get hold of paul after he'd been like missing forever and he was ill in bed and he was like i think i've overdone it i, I can't can't do this i can't do this all too much I, i'm backing out i can't pay it and basically he fell through like that and he left us in Bulgaria and we couldn't check out the hotel because we didn't have enough money to pay the hotel bill. So we couldn't even like run home back to England. Like we were locked in this hotel and we ended up moving into the same room. We went from two like lovely suites, right? To a tiny, like a tiny little hotel room that we both shared uh, together. And we basically, uh, you know, had the pressure of 
all these people need to pay and all this film was going to stop, all this shit was going on, no money whatsoever. And, and, and we just phoned everyone we knew to see if anyone had any money to help us out and get the film going again. And I remember, yeah. We, how, how far how far through the project were you at this point? We were about three weeks into prep. We'd built about two of the sets. Okay, so you hadn't shot anything. Not shot anything, but the actors okay. were lined up with dates and also the, um, the you know, we'd done sales and things for different territories. You know, there's a lot of the film in place in a lot of ways, but but literally didn't have any cash at all. It was a fucking nightmare. And, uh, and basically, um, uh, Keith and I, we basically, yes, yeah, sat, I remember just, we just we just phoned everyone we knew, and I remember one morning my phone rang, and and I'd spoken to the previous night I'd spoken to Gail, who actually had put the money in to do Tug of War, and was the producer of that, uh, and so I'd I'd phoned her and <laughs> cried over the phone about how miserable all this was. And anyway, she knew someone who knew someone who had some film money who was looking for like some projects or something, right? Uh, total random. Anyway, I, I, the phone rings. I pick it up, yeah. and it's this guy's. So it's called Man, it's Glenn Stewart. And he says this really deep, scary voice. I'm like, hello? And he's like, I believe you need some financing for your movie. Can you tell me what your uh, pre sale is in the UK? What amount is that coming to? And I'm like, um, I think you might want to talk to Keith, but I think it's about 200,000. And, and, and between Keith and I, like, sat in our underwear in the hotel room, running through all the details. And basically, Glenn was just like, okay, I'm going to pay the bill and fly you home. I'll see you in London on Tuesday. And he basically, like, wrote a check. Paid the, paid the construction guys, paid a hotel bill. We flew back to London and then sat with Glenn in Zilly Fish on Dean Street. And he literally wrote the contract to finance the tournament on a piece of yellow notepad paper. And it was done over some pasta and whatever else. And we, and like, again, we were so grateful he was paying for the meal because we couldn't afford shit. And Glenn, ultimately, he didn't even like the script. Like, but his son had watched the trailer and read the script and said, Dad, you shouldn't be making your awards script films that you're investing in. You should make this one. It's really cool. And he was like, look, I'll finance it as long as as long as long Duncan can be your um, your assistant and hang out with you guys on set. And I was like, sure. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, he could be in it. Yeah, yeah he can star. I don't care. It's yeah. at this rate. Yeah. Um, but no, no, he, he, Glenn, yeah, he basically put the money in and it was like that. And it was like, it was a bit needle in the haystack, honestly. And that, that got it back into production. And it was like, uh, uh, and that piece of paper I have framed, it's actually Manchester stuff, but I've got it framed because it has like seven points that are listed. And then Glenn disappeared into the world of banking again. And all the lawyers built the deal of the tournament around that yellow notepad paper. It was like infamous. Yeah, it was crazy. And he stuck to his word, man. He paid it. Money. Scott was 26 years old and was finally in charge of this multi-million dollar production. As the shoot was gearing up to start, I was curious about how much of a vision he had for the movie and how confident he was of being able to achieve it. It's interesting because I think I went into that. I knew what I, I knew instinctively kind of what I wanted and what I thought was good from a gauge point of view, right? But I didn't understand the the kind of reason why. And I think that happens when you're younger, right? Instinctively, you can have good I say good taste. You can have taste which which tells you whether something is good or bad, right? Um, but you might not understand the, the kind of the reasons why it psychologically had that effect on you, and then how to how to achieve it. So I think I kind of instinctively had this radar of right, and I, I feel like I know action films really well, and I know that like the energy of kind of action it needs to be kind of carried across and I, I kind of know if that's like a good stunt or not and it's a good lens you know like like things like so I knew pieces of that puzzle but I didn't know I didn't have a good plan but really I hired a DP who didn't usually do features he normally did second unit action and he was extremely grateful for the opportunity and it also put him in a place where he was where we were on like a mutual place. I wasn't like overwhelmed by this super experienced DP looking down on me. It was like, I just, I remember saying to him, like, I just want you to be my partner in crime, not be like my daddy, you know? So, um, uh, and but he was super experienced with action. So instinctively, like, he'd shot all these action films in Bulgaria, like all these, you know, I don't know if Expendables was at the time, but that kind of movie for Millennium. And um, so he had a really good understanding of like how to, you know, make a car look like it's driving fast, right? By having a wide lens really low down on the ground and he knew we needed this rig attached to a car rig to make it look fast. And um, and and so he brought a huge amount to it. The stunt team were incredible, like uh, alpha stunts, like, and they were just an incredible stunt team. And JJ Perry, I had this guy doing second unit directing and, uh, and fight coordinating. 
and uh, Bessie did all the physical fight stuff. And he was just like uh, unbelievable. And so I kind of learned on the film a lot of those kind of, you know, like pro versions of um, how to do certain action things. Um, but, but it was very, um, I had to embrace the nonsense honestly in the end with that movie because I think I think on the flip side of it all is it wasn't necessarily the script that I went, wanted to go into production with. Like if you look at the original trailer I did and the original script we were all intending to do, it kind of got over the two-year journey into production, it kind of got slightly bastardized by um, various different kind of like a distributor wanted some of this and the people wanted this and they didn't want so much first act, all this stuff. And, and as a first time filmmaker, I didn't have much defense or much powder in my cannon to defend against those things. Um, and I remember the script I wasn't 100% happy with, the sequences I was happy with, but the script and the way it kind of played out, I wasn't that happy with and I tried to make it, I tried to get as happy as I could with it. But I, I remember kind of thinking, this film's kind of daft and, and it's like, but, and I wasn't quite sure of where the tone sat. I wanted to make it intense and real and all these things, but the action kind of leaned into kind of much more fun. Yeah, you had a lot of humor. Well, but yeah, but, well. yeah, well, but that, that said, I, I I think I accidentally stumbled through the humor uh, and then found it in the edit and, and played with it in the edit, actually, because I think I ended up on the first cut of the movie. And actually, a lesson to all, all people out there, right? I remember watching the assembly. I remember seeing the scenes and, and being in Bulgaria doing this whole thing. It was a whole adventure, right? But uh, I remember seeing six cuts of scenes that Rob Hall, the editor, had cut. And I was like, wow, that scene looks, is looking really cool. I'm, I was kind of excited to see the film together. And I remember I watched I watched on the train from Manchester to London when I got back in there, I watched the assembly and it was and I cried. It was so bad. So bad. <laughs> it's yeah. universal. Everybody <laughs> hates the first assembly, just <laughs> anywhere in the world. Well, you should be like, people should tell you that, right? Because I didn't know that. So I'm expecting it to see like, oh yeah, here's my Terminator 2, everyone. And I remember just watching it on this thing and I was like, oh my god, I hope. And I swear, I was I was thinking, I hope the train crashes. I hope the whole film falls apart and no one ever sees it, otherwise I'm never working again. And I remember like all these horrific kind of thoughts of like, I have really fucked this up. I have fucked it up so bad. And it's like, and it just, because you don't tend to see a film that doesn't work. Um, sure. You know, I'd never seen one before that didn't work. And I, it was screaming at me that this didn't work. So And it was um, yours, yeah. And it was mine, I had to fully own it. I was the only person left because that, that production itself was this whole adventure. So. I, I ended up being the only, like myself and Rob, like essentially like the, uh, there was a whole kind of thing where I ended up having to finish producing the film myself and uh, and handling it all and stuff. And it was just like, and it, and it went into this, like after the shoot and after that, it kind of went into this dark place of, I was all alone and like, uh, and, and there was no one else to do the film with. It had run out of money, it, it had gone over budget and all this stuff. And there was no one around to really help. And it was just me, uh, and let's say Rob, in some tiny little um, room in London. And we ended up cutting a promo, weirdly, cutting a version of the promo that I'd cut to get the film made, but a finished promo and kind of and doing that. And actually we, Eddie Hamilton, the editor, he was also editing on it time but I remember like the nail in my coffin slightly was when Eddie who at the time was kind of upcoming editor now like Eddie's doing doing um, yeah he was always amazing but he was he's doing amazing now um and uh but I remember even Eddie like turning to me and he looked at the production he looked at the mess of the assembly he looked at uh, there was no one around there was no like viable production it was like there was no like I was writing checks from my own account to pay for people it was a whole horrible mess that had been left and uh, and I remember Eddie saying to me uh, after he'd kind of finished he said listen Scott I, I'll be honest I, I can't I, I, I can't do this in my life right now I've, I've done this once before and I'm not doing it again like this film is a disaster and I can't I can't be there with you for, <laughs> for the confidence yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank young, you they, thanks, thanks you my Eddie. last you my last Eddie <laughs> yeah and I love Eddie bits right yeah but he didn't mean it I don't think as like in that respect but in, uh, but but he but he was but I remember that's what left me and, and at the time his assistant Rob in the streets of Soho after Eddie left and I was like Rob do you want to do you want to go over it in the film he's like give it a go yeah sure and it was like me and the assistant editor, uh, um, and we had to, yeah, we had to cut this promo um, and and then get the film together. And, and the truth is, like, then then thankfully, again, we go from like depressing to happy, right? And uh, the film, 
We knew the film didn't quite work, but we had an idea how to make it work, but there was no money left. And the financer wasn't going to put a penny more. He was just like, just finish it and hand me it. Um, and I knew I was being asked to hand a shit in, right? Um, and so we did this promo, and basically, Vic Behrman took it to the Air Film Film Festival, so we handed the Air Film Film Festival, and it, and it had kind of a growing heat because people had heard about the film and all this stuff. And, uh, and they tried to sell it using that promo. And the promo, promo, and then like two little clips of scenes, like two action scenes, actually. And they did it, and, and it was nerve wracking. I remember watching it with everyone, and I was like, does that go down well? I don't know. And then, and then and I remember like hanging around LA, just nervous that like whatever happened. Basically, Harvey Weinstein went into Vic's booth or whatever, right, at, at, at the Lowe's Hotel, and he'd never had Harvey come in to buy any of his films. Like this was like rock star Weinstein yeah. uh, kind of walking in and yeah. basically wanted to buy the movie for what turned out to be a $4 million domestic pre-sale, which is wow. huge. And I can't yeah. believe we didn't do more publicity at the time for that. Yeah. But essentially the film kind of made its money back and and the financer and everyone were over the moon. And from that point, I remember him phoning me saying how pleased he was and how that I basically let me know how much it's going to cost to finish it properly and let's finish it properly. So that was amazing. And then um, and then, yeah, and then we finished the film and then, uh, and then, yeah, I feel like, I feel like uh, every story I'm telling you, Jeff, leads to a, a heartbreak story because <laughs> it's like, I was going to say, all that great stuff led to more heartbreak around the corner, right? Why, so, what happened then? Um, in the, I, I, I basically, again, I, I've never tried so hard for a single thing. And like, and you make sacrifices doing that, right? The truth is you make sacrifices like with relationships, with your life. Like I, I lived in this basement with Rob for the for months to make sure every moment and every frame I could make was the very best version of what it could be. Um, and and a lot of that movie, I think, is like, is noodling low budget versions of stuff to a decent place that kind of fools you into thinking it's a big budget version of it, you know? So it's kind of like, like there might be some like nice stuff sporadically, but it's super low budget. And it, it's like doing your own special effects to make that look good as opposed to what it should be. Um, and anyway, I, I bled for it. I remember I, I literally like, I, I did huge amounts to get it into a place where the film got finished and people were happy. Um, and Weinsteins were gonna release it theatrically and they fought the rest of the world territories to go theatrically. Um, in fact, to be fair, Harvey on the final cut paid more money to re-edit it and add this extra stuff with Ving Rhames in, which was actually a really good suggestion of his. Like I'd been so close to the movie, he watched it and he gave these notes like through his assistant or something, right? And and, and Rob and I were like, you gotta be fucking kidding us. That's like a huge change. It was basically what, bringing- what, what was it? It was a change. It was like Ving didn't appear until page, until sorry, minute like halfway through the movie, like minute 50 or something. And then we had to, Harvey was like, Ving's gotta be in the film by 20 minutes or-, or well, He was in the opening act, wasn't he? Oh, sorry, yeah. after that. Yeah, sorry, he's yeah. in the opening act, but then- right. Then you know when he's he's they they kind of run through the tournament players. Yeah. It, it originally was that he was a surprise player that comes in late, and um uh and and Harvey was like, you've got to put him in that uh, you know the original shout out and get him in from the start and add him with some extra scenes and all this and and we basically like scraped together outtakes and did some shooting with like a double and all this stuff to make these extra scenes with Ving to tell more of a story to thread him through more. Uh, yeah, so Harvey had like, they'd really, you know, they'd essentially uh, backed it and pushed it and, and fought for this theatrical slot. And and it was very exciting, you know, he was going to release it on like 2,000, 3,000 screens, whatever it was. It was this very exciting thing. And especially as a first time filmmaker, that's like the wet dream, right? Like you're so excited about that kind of thing. And it felt like it was going to be worth the, F, you know, the, the, the pain. And then, um, and then it ended up that uh, Weinstein's went under um and and basically i heard that they were going to essentially dump the movie straight to dvd um and not release it because they couldn't afford to i spoke to harvey and again i was ending up like producing this thing kind of on my own at this point so i remember phoning harvey and despite the fact i was nervous to talk to harvey it was a whole thing of like can we at least release the uk theatrical first and then i got on the phone with the uk distributor and we were trying to get it so i could at least have the theatrical slot in the uk before releasing it world first on DVD. 
And ultimately it didn't happen. And then we ended up like getting it released on DVD, which kind of broke my heart quite a lot, you know, for the US. I remember going to the, like, the screening premiere, which was really nice, actually. It was Scream Fest, and it screened, and Jono and I went over and went to this thing. And I remember I remember the exec at the Weinsteins was like, invited us to a party with the remaining members of The Doors the next day or something after the screening. Mm. And Jono and I were like, sorry, we just can't drag ourselves away from the fact that the Weinsteins have now ruined our life. We uh, So we drove to <laughs> Vegas instead, and had a night in Vegas of just, <laughs> like, just uh, sadness, like crying. Um, uh, <laughs> And then, and then, yeah, and then it released. It released everywhere else, uh, apart from the UK. And I held on to the fact that the UK was like going to be finally released, like because the UK had tested, and he said he was going to release theatrically. And it was all. It, it felt like that was the kind of runners-up prize. Like it's going to release theatrically in the UK, and it's very exciting. Um, and especially for me being from the UK, I was, I was, you know, I was very excited about the fact that that was going to happen. And then, uh, and then ultimately, yeah, the the the. It was actually the day my son Joseph was born. I would, I remember being in the hospital uh, while with my wife, waiting for my son to be born. There's a few complications and, and we're there. And I was looking on, it had been tagged to be released, the film, on a certain date. And there's a f- launch, film launch site that you can look at, which kind of updates the week, you know, the slots of when your film's coming out. And I remember looking on that. And just to kind of see how many screens it's going on and all these kind of updates that come on. And it was all, you know, it was going to get a saturated release. So it was all very exciting. Um, and, uh, and the day that Joseph actually was born, it disappeared off the list. And I was like, mm, that's odd. And I thought it was just some kind of technical error. And I obviously had a baby boy. So I was very distracted and excited and all this stuff. And, um, and I'd waited like a year since this US release. So it was like a long time coming to this point. And then... I spoke to the distributor like a week later and so I had to move it because another film came on that weekend. So don't worry, I'm going to release it though. It's just going to be a bit late, probably November. I'll find a date. I'm like, okay, okay. And I'm kind of panicking, panicking. Meanwhile, the film's been released everywhere else in the world on DVD and God knows what. Uh, anyway, he finds the date and it plays trailers at the cinema. I see trailers of my film at the cinema, which is also a giddy moment to behold, right? Um, and I book tickets, me and my friends book tickets to watch it. Uh, on you know to go into the cinema and watch it and then in the end it got pushed so far to the right that the guy said I'm sorry but it's just it's been released everywhere else in the world now I'm going to have to just dump it on the DVD because no, uh, I've spent, spent the yeah, p and I've spent the money I'm never getting it back and he didn't even do a DVD release really like he dumped it on like bottom shelf DVDs and HMV it's never been on British television oh, it's ne- sorry. And it's just like that depressing thing of like what a and, and it's weird though because like in hindsight like it went out elsewhere in the, around the world and people have since kind of you know who've seen it theatrically around the world in different places it holds a different you know it holds a different status but from a, certainly for the UK more than anything else it just no it was like it was totally underground the way it kind of dropped and no one was able to see it, it was, and considering it was set in the UK by a, a British director yeah um uh, British filmmaker, sorry. That uh, it was a really, yeah, it was a real shame that it didn't get more uh, more of its shot. Uh, it's, you know what I mean? It still launched your career, though, and, you know, you learned so much from it, and, you know, it's yep, first that's movie. True. Yeah. But it's good, <laughs> it's good for everybody just to see and to hear and for, and, yeah. and for you to remember as well how difficult it was and you know, mm. what you actually went through it makes you appreciate everything that you're doing yeah. today so much more so and it, that's part really of this does. podcast you know yeah. it's like for me when I've had assistants on jobs and they've asked me how I've got into the industry every director loves talking about that, really <laughs> let's face it clearly it's, it's, there's a lot of hardship you know um, in so most cases ones. anyway yeah. and and it's you know it's inspiring for them to hear but it's also for us it makes us yeah. realise how lucky we are to yeah. be working directors in this industry and you know, yeah. living in in Los yeah. Angeles, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think doing what you love to do, and as you get older, I'm sure you notice this. Like, it's like you, it's it's never easy. I think you know if you if you're you, to try and like make a career out of a hobby, essentially, is like never easy, is it? And I think, um, and yeah, you do. You look at it. You don't. I think when you're younger, you don't maybe realize what you have as well as kind of, you know, you, it's harder to measure what you lose as well, right? So I think, um, uh, but I think we're, yeah, we're amazingly lucky to be doing 
And I, I'm much more grateful now than I would have been back then about being able to, to yeah, to do something that brings you so much joy. The, the joy of the kind of craft and creation and doing that, to enjoy that part of it, you know what I mean? And it's like, and, and not, not worry so much. I think your first film, and actually this stops a lot of filmmakers, like doing a film, you worry so much that it's gotta be amazing or that's it. And then you realize maybe when it's not amazing that, well, it's okay, you can go again. It's like, it really, it's your own heart you've got to heal from and you can move forward. And I think the best thing, just like when we would make films as kids and all these stuff, it's like, just keep doing it. Do you know what I mean? If you keep doing it, you will exercise those muscles. You might fail at the race, you might fall flat on your face, but if you get back up again and do it, that's what progresses you and that's what makes you move forward and you, and you have more control that way as well. And it's less... So, so do you think that some of, you know, because, you know, we've all seen directors rise and fall as well. And, yeah. you know, some of them go to movie jail because they've had yeah. a bad hit, you know, a, you know, a, a big failure financially, even though critically yeah. and, you know, it might have been a great movie. Yeah. Do you feel like part of the reason why they haven't directed another film for like the next decade is down to them as much as uh, the industry i think so yeah i think it's definitely like i didn't i didn't direct a film after the tournament for another four years five years and like that so it took me a long time to actually direct a film again yeah i think it is down to the director i think you you know look it's like uh, is it better to have loved and lost and never loved at all right it's like and, and you if you really put your heart into something you care about you it really hurts you if you if if your heart's broken for whatever reason, and I think one way or another your heart gets broken a little bit on whatever job, whether it goes, you know, what I mean, like in some way along the line it breaks, right? And and I think you have to you need to kind of replenish and heal from that before you kind of can put it on the sleeve again and do it again. So I think that that's definitely and if you and, and direct a jail as well, that whole thing of especially if you get hit with. I think this, it's weird when you look at directors who, like, I'm honestly glad, and, and I'm not just, like, there is a part of me that would love to have seen, like, the tournament go theatrically in the US and and make money if it made money, all this kind of stuff. Like, I'd be curious to know how that plays out. And it might be an exciting thing that I, I in retrospect, kind of missed out on. But I actually think I'm really grateful of the way things are played out because I've seen people have hits, first hits, or second, you know, early hits, um, as filmmakers and then they can't get there after that and they have so much fear of failing to achieve what they achieved before it, it stops them doing anything and I think I think if you actually you know essentially fail the first time or don't succeed to such a degree that it's kind of intimidating then then I think you uh, it, it's easier to get back on the saddle you know and, and, and say okay I'm going to try it this way this time and do it this way but um, yeah I think it's it's you know it's curse a lot of the time I think if you have a, an early hit like I, it's just, just you well, the Orson Welles thing right you know. yeah it is depressing isn't it it's like in an ideal world you kind of get you get better and better one way or another and you um, yeah. but yeah but it's hard like I, I think it's a hard thing to hard thing to do and, and it, but there's different skill sets right like, there's different elements of skill sets and I think you've got to be honest about like what really brings you joy and what you really think maybe your strength is and like rather than trying to be, to, to look up to someone else or have a career of someone else's, like lean into what's good that you're strong about, you're good with, mm -hmm. and that that really, whether it's the thing you wanted to be good at as a kid or not, but you might just be good at, mm -hmm. it, it can be worth just like winning with that. And yeah, don't just try to escape uh, what you think you should be and just try and like embrace what you... Well, I think should. that's the takeaway of this story is, you know, mm -hmm. be who you are and don't look at other people and compare yourself to other yeah. people out there you know you've got yeah. to discover who you are and work to those strengths yeah 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 it's like yeah definitely <laughs> Do so, don't try to be who you got to be it'll just depress you you're like oh yeah like, yeah Christian Nolan's doing good hey. <laughs> alright well let's take a little break right, um, this is kind of midway point we'll come back after the Great. break and um, we'll, um, we'll ask some more questions thanks for listening if you enjoyed the show, I'm not going to ask you to give it a five-star review or for you to subscribe. And there is no Patreon site. 
I created this show to help people who don't have mentors or role models. People who want to work in the film industry but don't know which path they should take. So if you know someone who might like or benefit from the show, all I'm asking is for you to share it with them. And who knows, maybe one day you'll be listening to their story. Remember 19 media.